Hi, and welcome to the FIXIS webinar on solutions journalism. Thank you for joining me here today. I want to start this by asking you one question. Think of a one word answer or just a short sentence about what solutions journalism is to you. And you can just you can just think about it quietly in your own head. You don't have to write it down or anything. And in the meantime, I'll introduce myself. I started my career in local news in Scotland and have since 2015 been with The Local, which is a news organisation with sites in nine European countries, writing about our country's news in English for foreign professionals. So that's people who have moved to our countries from abroad who want to understand what's going on. And about seven years ago, we launched a membership based paywall. And that's around the time when my own solutions journalism journey started. Because we realised that to be valuable to readers, we couldn't just rely on stories that would bring in the traffic, but that we needed to pivot to journalism that was deliberately explanatory, context providing, problem solving and audience driven. And solutions journalism didn't make up all of that, but it was one of many parts, and it's something that I've taken a personal interest in. And to me, to answer the question that I just asked you to think about, solutions journalism is about providing crucial context for the audience. So not just stopping at the problem, but telling the whole story, the nuances, how do we solve this? What happens next? And especially for the local, since we write about foreigners, we often write about migration. And that's definitely an area where journalism could use a bit more context and constructiveness and, and solutions. And I'm also a solutions journalism trainer. And some of what I'm about to talk to you about isn't just based on my own personal experience, but also the experience of people I've talked to in other newsrooms. And this webinar is part of my newsletter course in Solutions Journalism, which is published by The Fix. And The Fix is a media publication and knowledge hub for media professionals. Its mission is to crack the media management puzzle through insights, solutions and data. And a lot of the grand visions of journalism tend to come out of the US. So what The Fix does is that it tries to be that voice in Europe. And although they don't only do solutions journalism, what, what I quite like is the approach that it's not just all, oh, the, the media industry is doomed. Uh, we're all, it's all dying out. But rather like, how do we fix the challenges that we face? Like news avoidance or loss in trust or disinformation or the AI unknowns and so on and so on. And, I'm not actually going to use this webinar to talk a lot about solutions journalism itself. And much of what we're about to talk about can actually be applied to a lot of different areas in journalism or even to your career, perhaps. But just so that we're all on the same page when we define it, I use the same definition that the Solutions Journalism Network does. That solutions journalism is rigorous reporting about responses to social problems specifically focusing on the response to the problem, whether or not it's successful, rather than the problem itself. And it always includes these four ingredients. It goes into detail about how a response works. It provides evidence that shows whether or not it works. It doesn't shy away from also reporting on where the response falls short. And it shows what others can learn from it in the future. And here's another question I want you to briefly have a think about. What's the biggest obstacle to doing more solutions journalism in your newsroom? Because if you're watching this web webinar, I'm guessing that you want to do more solutions journalism. And whatever you answered to that question, really, you're probably not alone. But these tend to be some of the most common concerns not having enough time in the busy news day, not having enough support from managers or even from those you yourself manage, not having enough knowledge of what solutions journalism is or how to do it, and not having enough money or people who can spend time on it. Those tend to be some of the main, some of the main barriers to newsrooms actually doing solutions journalism. 
And I mean, honestly, I'm a solutions evangelist myself, and I don't always practice what I preach. There are definitely times when I get into the mindset of, oh, God, I, I don't care what the solution is. I just need to get this story about the problem up quickly and then log out and go home. So these are all legitimate concerns. But the good news is they're also all fixable or at least mitigable. Now, there has been a lot of talk about leadership in recent years. And it's not just managers even that are encouraged to lead, but also people on the floor are you know, taught to manage upwards. And a lot of the advice that you get is about you. You need to speak louder. You need to lead with authority. And you get all these articles about how, how extroverts make the best leaders or introverts make the best leaders. And you can do quizzes showing what kind of leader you are. And I mean, that's, that's all good and well, but I would argue that the main thing that matters isn't who you are or how you lead. You don't even have to consider yourself a leader because you're not the story. It doesn't matter whether you're an editor or a reporter or a photographer or a social media expert, and it doesn't matter whether you're a big talker or you're the gray mouse in the corner of the room, because in the end, it's not about you. Now, we know for a fact that audience trust and news is falling, that more and more people actively avoid the news. And I believe that solutions journalism can be part of the answer. And the good news is we have a growing amount of data that back that up. Survey suggests that um, readers are more likely to trust a solution story they are more likely to engage with and spend more time reading the story. They are more likely to say that they've been given a greater understanding of the issue. And they're more likely to return to your coverage in the future. But here's the thing. This may be a bit controversial, but solutions journalism is not the story either. Now, it's, it's tempting to start from the space of the thing you're pitching whether it's solutions journalism or something else. Like the instinct is to start with why, why solutions journalism is so amazing, why it increases trust or hope or offers more context or tells the whole story or whatever when you try to pitch it to somebody else. But actually, it's about knowing your audience. The audience is the story. So who's the audience? Well, in this case, by audience, I don't actually mean your readers or viewers or listeners. I mean, of course, they matter too. But I mean the people who need to accept your pitch. That could be your managers, your peers, your direct reports. And that's where your focus needs to be. I mean, we all know probably that before we launch a new editorial project, we usually start by doing market research. We ask our readers and so on what their needs are. And then when we launch it, we often explain to them that here's what we're doing, here's why we're doing it. And I feel like it's, it's too rare that we take our time to do the same kind of market research within our own newsrooms. And now I've been very lucky to work with really good managers and reporters with a lot of support and flexibility for trying new ideas. But even regardless of whether you're in that kind of newsroom or if you're in a more sort of traditional one with clear gatekeepers, you're probably still going to need a bit of strategic diplomacy to put your ideas to the test. And I recently read Kaiser Loff and Karen McIntyre's study on journalists' perception of solutions journalism and its place in the field. And what they found when interviewing news, news, uh, sorry, newsroom journalists is that for a solutions journalism project to be successful, everyone needs to pull in the same direction. And there have been countless other studies that show the same thing. You might be familiar with media analyst Lucy King's hearts and minds theory in her, in her essay on shifting from print to digital that to create long lasting change, you essentially need to win over the hearts and minds of everyone in the newsroom so that they are also invested in and are also sort of constantly working towards making that change happen. 
So this quote here on the screen is from the Lough and McIntyre's conclusion that it's not enough for the journalists themselves to think of solutions journalism as a worthwhile pursuit. It takes management having the same thoughts. And I want to add a caveat here. The quote singles out management, which is fine, but management is sometimes unfairly, I think, seen as this big gatekeeper when it actually works the other way around as well. You can be a great manager and a visionary leader, but unless your reports also think of solutions journalism as a worthwhile pursuit, it's unlikely to stick. Now, they also found that there need to be, or there tend to be, three main layers that need changing in order to create a lasting solutions journalism focus. First, there's the institutional level, a lot of newsrooms are still trying to project, protect the institution of journalism as we know it in a world where it's being threatened from several directions at the same time. And part of that is clinging on to some of its core tenets, like objectivity, for example. And I would argue, of course, that it's perfectly possible to be objective while doing solutions journalism, but it tends to be one of the things that skeptics are concerned about. And secondly, that's the individual level. Journalists themselves, they need to just change the way they approach a story, like the framing, the research, the questions they ask interviewees, how they package their story. So aside from sort of grand vision, people also need to change their day-to-day -day work. And thirdly, there's the organizational level. We need support from various points on the hierarchy of the newsroom for these stories to even make it to publication like from managers and from the floor. And the things that drive your colleagues in the newsroom, their goals, their concerns, they're not always the same. It's easy to say that everyone in the newsroom should work towards the same goals, but if we break it down to the factors that steer our personal day-to-day -day work, that's usually not the case. Uh, you might have a manager who's preoccupied with how we meet our key performance indicators, whether there are clicks or subscriptions or something else. You might have a reporter thinking, well, my job is to uncover problems, not solutions. Or even, I just have to finish this article by the deadline. Please don't distract me. Well, you need to understand this. Because, I mean, if you start from the space of solutions journalism, yeah, th there's a good chance that everyone will agree that it sounds great, it sounds nice. It's good to have an approach that can increase trust, decrease news avoidance. But at the same time, we're also all very much guided by ticking the things we have to do right now off our list before we can go home for the day. And this is a bit of a concept that I've taken from the world of marketing. And I talk about this a bit in the Solutions Journalism news newsletter course for the fix. What problem does solutions journalism solve for key newsroom stakeholders? And marketing is sometimes a bit of a forbidden thought in journalism, but I actually think there's a lot to be learned in terms of communication. And one of the hardest truths that marketers have to learn is that no one cares about their product. People care about their own lives and about the product no more than the impact it has on their lives. That's like to the point that problem solving has become a marketing concept. And that's a useful thought to keep in the back of your mind when you go into this. How can your product, which in this case is solutions journalism, solve the problem that key newsroom stakeholders, that's your managers, your peers, your reports, how does it solve the problems that they have? Now let's take a more in-depth look at what these problems might be. So I'm going to go through three examples of people and reactions that you may encounter in the newsroom. And I apologize that these are extremely stereotypical. I'm not trying to say that everyone in the newsroom fits one of these boxes. My point is just that you have to sort of adapt your message to the audience. Now, the key performance indicator obsessive is probably someone you've met. You may even be that person yourself. <laughs> Everything they do is guided by how do we meet our targets? And that's a relevant concern. 
And it's important not to get defensive. I mean, what they're saying might be that solutions journalism is expensive. We don't have the resources. Negative news is what actually sells. And we need to focus on traffic or subscriptions. And look for what they're actually saying. What's the problem behind those words? It could be different things, depending on the person. Uh, we're struggling to meet up subscription targets, could be one of them. We're short on money, could be another. That's a pretty valid problem to have in the news industry. And what can solutions journalism do to fix these problems? Well, you, you might be able to find a grant that would pay for a solution project. You may want to bring out the figures that we talked about in the beginning, which show that solutions journalism can actually help bring in those reads and conversions that you need. It might be the silver bullet that can turn things around for the newsroom, that one thing that you haven't yet tried. Maybe you shouldn't even mention the word solutions and just try to present a story in a new way, then get the data on how that story performed and use that to back up your future pitch. And I just want to take a second here to really stress that when we go through these examples of newsroom stakeholders that may be harder than others to convince about solutions journalism, I, I don't want you to think of them as your opponents. I don't think that any of them are necessarily wrong. They're just coming to it from and with a different perspective. Now, very common criticism of solutions journalism is that it takes sides and it's just empty good news stories. That can be true. Now, of course, if you do real solutions journalism the way it's meant to be done, it's not true. But I mean, let's be honest, there are plenty of examples out there of poor solutions journalism, just like there's examples of other kinds of poor, poor journalism. But what I hear from, from these kinds of people let's call them the idealists, is that they want to tell the whole story. They want to reveal problems. And solutions journalism, despite the name, can actually help them do this. If, if one town has implemented, say, a, a successful affordable housing scheme, that gives us a yardstick for success and for failure that can help us reveal how badly another town is failing at this. And solutions journalism, when done right, is actually less biased than problem-focused journalism because it helps us tell that whole story. It doesn't just stop at the problem, but it also tells us what's next. And as you know, it doesn't shy away from reporting on the limitations of a response. But I think you need to meet people where they're at. And if I were managing a person like this, I probably wouldn't start by sending them to cover a potential solution story. I would instead start by just letting them do their regular investigative reporting, but it's kind of slowly getting them to insert questions with the solutions focus or do a solutions angle as a follow up to one of their problem stories. And we talk about some of these questions in the email course. And I remember that I was once approached by an editor after I gave a talk on solutions journalism and she said that a lot of the focus tends to be on convincing your managers to let you do solutions journalism. But she was like, oh, I'd love for my reporters to do more of this. And it's like walking through mud. They just don't want to get on board. And I think, of, I think a lot of that comes down to this, that we're just all so worn out. And a lot of the time when a manager su suggests a new project, it immediately sets alarm bells ringing among, the, among journalists. Like not another thing that we have to do. So I would say make sure the change is actually a change, something old being replaced by something new, not just another task that's added to your newsroom's already pretty full plate. Because one common reason why a skeptic might be opposed to a change is just because they are afraid that their workload is already too heavy to take it on board. So freeing up time, that's essential. And that includes freeing up time for learning as well. When, when I have to do something new, I definitely find that I need more time at the start to learn, to get in a kind of creative mind space so that I can get excited about the project before I begin. And Assume everyone has good intentions. 
your manager or your direct reports or your peers aren't blocking your ideas because they're evil or because they don't know any better. They just have different key priorities. And because you're the one doing the pitching, that means it's your job to bridge that divide. And that means speaking to them in a language that they understand. And maybe not assuming that you already know what that language is. So before you talk, you need to listen. And you can do this formally if you want to. You can actually do an official listening tour of your newsroom where you sit down with people and interview them about their thoughts and their concerns. You can also do it informally. Whatever works best for you and for your newsroom. But the important thing is that you start by actually listening to what the person you're talking to is saying. Like not what you want them to say or what you think they should have said but didn't, but what they're actually saying. And listen out for cues as well that may indicate hidden meaning. Because, for example, if you're a manager, no matter how good a relationship you think you have with your direct reports, they might still not feel comfortable telling you if they think they don't have the time to do what you ask. And then you might even want to loop their answer back to them. Like, here's what I'm hearing. You, you think that solutions journalism is a good idea, but you sound skeptical. I wonder if, whether you feel that you might be too, too pressed for time to undertake a new big project right now. Or, here's what I'm hearing. You're worried that readers are avoiding the news. I wonder if solutions journalism could be the answer. There's another newspaper that did that. And they found that it increased reads by so-and-so. Could it be worth trying a new approach to just to shake things up? And the third step then is to listen, of course, to their reaction to your understanding of what they just said. And the reason why listening is so important is that if you use the wrong messaging for the wrong people, it's not going to work. If you tell the worn out journal that solutions journalism is about telling the whole story, it doesn't solve their problem. I mean, in fact, it might even make it worse. And I want to give you one final piece of advice. So if you've read a lot about solutions journalism and you're deep in the community, it's easy to want to do more than your newsroom is equipped for. We should do a big engagement project. We should do a massive 10 part series about how to fix schools. We need to completely change the way we measure our key performance indicators and use impact as our North Star metric. Now, if this is not where your newsroom is at, chances are you're going to just end up hitting your head against the wall. So you need to start in their space and bring them along on the journey in baby steps. Uh, now, I don't know if you're familiar with Karl Popper's uh, cloud problems versus clock problems theory. Uh, I, um, I learned this from uh, Tran Ha, who is a design thinking specialist in the US. She used to work for Stanford. And basically, it can be boiled down to this. Uh, so clock problems, they're very technical problems. Uh, a clock works in a certain way. And if it breaks, you can fix it assuming, of course, that you have the tools and you have the skills. But clouds, clouds are ever moving, ever changing. And just when you think you've figured them out, they change again. And in the news industry, we deal a lot in the world of cloud problems. So to some extent, things are never going to be perfect. And we need to be comfortable with that state of imperfection. So at the start, I asked you what solutions journalism meant to you. And the reason I did that is because I do think that even though you need to adapt your message to the audience, it's important to not adapt so much that it's no longer true to what, what you want to do. So I just want to, you to hold on to that core as well. And for me personally, the best thing about solutions journalism is not actually the solutions projects that I've done, but how the principles have made the rest of my journalism better, even when it's not perfect solutions journalism. And with that in mind, um, thank you for watching this webinar. 
I hope you've found it useful as you continue to navigate your newsroom and solutions journalism and the media industry. Uh, please continue to follow The Fix and subscribe to our newsletters if you haven't already. And don't hesitate to, um, to reach out to me if you, have, uh, if you have any questions at all. And uh, you can find my email on one of the slides at the start of the presentation. So thank you and bye.